friends, welcome once again to our online worship here at the First Baptist Church of Freehold. I'm so glad that you've joined us this morning as we take some time out of our schedules to give thanks to our Lord and God. I pray that God has blessed each and every one of you this week and that this service will be a time for you to offer praise and thanksgiving and to unburden yourself of whatever cares have been weighing you down. So come, let us worship the Lord our God. For the Lord is our God, and we are the Lord's people. As we wait upon the Lord, let us open our ears that we might, might both hear and heed the word of the Lord. As we wait upon the Lord, let us open our eyes that we might both see and perceive the will of the Lord. As we wait upon the Lord, let us open our hearts that we might understand with our hearts and turn to the Lord for healing. Amen. We begin this morning with all verses of In Christ There Is No East or West. to come, we may find a need 
to change this plan, to adapt to the situations we find ourselves in. But as it stands now, on August 2nd, uh, the first Sunday of August, we will have worship on the grounds of First Baptist. When Arden returns from her travels, she and Jen and myself will decide what will work best, whether we meet in front of the church on the lawn or whether we meet uh, in the parking lot. But we will communicate that to you in the weeks to come. We will meet, uh, weather permitting, on the grounds of the church for all of the Sundays in August. And if uh, we are blessed enough to be able to resume in-person worship, we will do so on the first Sunday of September here in our sanctuary. Uh, as we get closer to that date, we'll be able to more effectively communicate to you uh, the timeline for that and whatever protocols might need to be in place for us to resume worship here in the sanctuary. Uh, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to gather once again on the grounds and soon enough inside, and we look forward to seeing each and every one of you again as you feel comfortable returning. We have several prayer requests this week as we prepare ourselves for a time of communion with God. Um, we received word a few weeks ago that Gordon Clark, who was a former member here at First Baptist, passed away. So we ask pray for prayers for Gordon's family uh, as they deal with uh, you know, his absence in their lives now. Allison Hoffman requested prayers for her friend Susan Ricciardi, who is struggling with uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, we received word that uh, Myrna Bethke, who was a former pastor of our neighbors uh, over at the United Methodist Church, uh, passed away unexpectedly this week after suffering a stroke. So prayers for her and prayers for the United Methodist family. Uh, we continue to pray for Arden in her travels. Uh, she should be back with us later this week and we look forward to having her back uh, healthy and hopefully rested from her journeys. And finally, uh, this week, uh, Ed Dressler underwent a successful uh, heart ablation, so prayers for him and for Nancy as he continues in his recovery. Um, oh, and there is one final one. Uh, this is some good news. Uh, this past Sunday, about a week ago, uh, my friends Chip and Allison uh, gave birth to their uh, second child, a girl, Maeve Catherine. Uh, and she'll, she will be the younger sister of my godson, Luke. So, uh, prayers for the, the Herd family. With these thoughts on our hearts and in our minds, let us turn our concerns and our celebrations to God now. Lord, we have listened to the words of the street corner and of the marketplace. And we have heard the words of our friends and our neighbors. These words have often left us confused. They have not pointed the way to a clear and compelling goal. So we come to you, O Lord, in search of the word that gives direction and meaning to our lives. Speak that word to us now as we turn to you in silence. scatter the seeds of reconciliation and love upon us, and you wait. So much of that seed lands on the flat pathways or the rocky roads and won't take root. Lord, you scatter the seeds of healing and hope, 
and wait. Shallowness and fear claim those seeds, and they cannot live. Lord, you scatter the seeds of redemption and peace, and wait. These are the places of deep growth, where the seed will send down strong roots. So God who scatters seeds, we come to you this day with so many things on our hearts and our minds. Some of the events this week have been very positive and have caused us to celebrate. But we are still besieged by worries, doubts, and fears. These negative things crowd out your word, and we become like that useless soil, unable to receive and grow. So slow us down, Lord, we pray. Continue to pour your love on us, because we truly hunger and thirst for it. Forgive us when we allow the negativity and fear and anxiety to drown out your word. Scatter upon us again the seeds of peace and love, of hope and joy, so that we may be better disciples for you in this world which holds so much uncertainty. Help us to bear good fruit, the fruit which comes from the true vine, who has claimed us all as his own. And so we pray in the words that our Savior taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is, Open my eyes, that I may see. All verses.
starting in the 13th chapter. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone who has ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that Seeing, they do not perceive, and hearing, they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them, indeed, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand, and you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Here ends our reading from God's word. May God bless and magnify it to our use. Oh 
in the 80s, starring Rodney Dangerfield and Chevy Chase and Bill Murray, uh, where Bill Murray played the gardener, uh, Carl Spackler. And he was engaged in a personal war with the gopher who was damaging the grounds of the golf club. It was kind of a B plot, but it was always played for laughs. And Caddyshack seemed like it was always on during my childhood, whether it was Sunday afternoon movies when we got home from church, or the constant rotation on Comedy Central that was popular when I was a teen. And the funniest part for me in the film was this B plot about Carl Spackler becoming more and more unhinged, trying to take out this gopher. He goes after it with a sniper rifle. He puts a high-pressure hose down one of its holes. And in the climax of the movie, he blows up uh, part of the golf course trying to get this gopher. And I always thought that Bill Murray did a great job with this. And I thought it was strange, though, that he could be so incensed by this harmless little creature. Uh, but I want to formally admit, I totally get it now. Uh, this year, Jen and I put in a garden out back, and uh, after we got all of our plants in, we found out that we had a woodchuck. And now, we no longer have any pepper plants. I came to hate that gopher, I'm sorry, that woodchuck, as much as Carl Spackler hated that gopher. Because when we'd go out and find that our plants had been destroyed or uprooted, it seemed like a personal affront, destroying all of our hard work. All of the work we had put in coaxing growing things out of the ground. Our scripture this morning is about the struggle of growing things. This is one of the more dominant metaphors that we find in the Gospels about what the kingdom of God might be like. And this parable of someone scattering seed and waiting for plants to come up would have been intimately familiar to Jesus' audiences. They were largely an agricultural people in that time, and they knew what it meant to have a crop fail or be eaten by birds. They also knew what it meant to have a crop flourish, to have a bumper year. And it has long been an understanding in Christian studies that one of the reasons that Jesus uses so many of these agricultural metaphors is not just that his audiences would be familiar with them, but something about the slow, patient growth of seeds into plants that bear fruit mirrored the slow, patient growth of God's kingdom and the gospel taking root in people's hearts. In other places, Jesus describes the kingdom in immediate terms. We hear about it coming like a thief in the night, or maidens with lanterns waiting for the bridegroom to appear. But in these agricultural metaphors, Jesus takes the long view about plants. And I think about us as well. At my last church, I served as the director of Christian education, as well as the associate pastor. And for the three years that I was there, I got to see kids move through this program that I oversaw. We saw the little ones move from the nursery into first or second grade. We saw those kids move into first communion class during their fourth grade year, and then into confirmation when they became high school aged. And in my brief time there, I got a chance to see the ways that their faith life deepened as they moved from stage to stage to stage. They went from coloring pages with smiling robed figures to asking questions about their church, about their faith, about the world, about their friends of different races and faiths, trying to understand the majesty of God's creation as it applied to their own lives. And just as tomato or pepper plants start from seed and move on to sprout, and then into blossom, and then into fruit, I had the chance to watch these kids develop through these distinct stages as well. And it's as true for them as it is for us. We move through stages of development in our faith lives. 
I was baptized when I was 12 or 13. I struggled with my faith during my teenage years. And even now, as someone who has been through college and seminary, served as a chaplain, served as an associate pastor, took some time away from religious work, I'm still learning about what God has in store for me, for this community, for the church in general, and for the whole world. I'm still learning how I can be a better Christian, as I'm sure all of you are as well. These last few months have been one of the strangest seasons in the life of the church that any of us have seen. As we're beginning our preparations now to return to in-person worship here, hopefully in September, we're starting to ask questions about what that will look like. And we're going to have to ask questions about what worship looks like. We're going to have to develop and change, move into a new way of being, at least for the time being. We may return into the sanctuary wearing masks. That one's pretty much a given. We won't be able to pass the peace to one another. We won't be able to pass offering plates or collection plates, I'm uh, sorry, communion plates. We might not even be able to sing, as right now we're finding out more and more that aerosolization uh, causes this virus to spread. And when we sing or speak at loud volumes, that risk increases. This might seem like a confusing time. It is. We're going to have to consider what this next phase in the life of this church is going to be, at least until we have a vaccine or uh, the next technological development, which will allow us to move past these concerns. And as we consider all of these things, I can really relate to the disciples in our lesson this morning who need Jesus to explain things to them. They think they understand. They think they know what Jesus means. Even though they're fishermen, so maybe their knowledge of growing things isn't as deep as it might otherwise be. They get what Jesus is saying about plants and seeds and scattering them and all of that, but they can't see what this has to do with the kingdom. And the answer they get from Jesus isn't really the most reassuring one. He tells them he speaks in parables. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand. And you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. We know that Jesus is quoting Isaiah there. I don't know about you, though. That still seems like a bitter pill to swallow. The harder part, though, comes just a couple of verses before that. From those who have nothing, even that will be taken. And I struggle with that. How can we square that teaching with a God who tells us that he will go look for the one lost sheep, leaving behind the 99? How can we square that with a kingdom, we are told, where the first shall be last and the last shall be first? How can we square that with a God that asks us to love our neighbors as ourselves. This teaching, if pulled out of the text, can leave us as confused as the disciples. But there's an answer to be found in that further explanation Jesus gives to the disciples. He tells them that, like the seeds that are scattered on the path, those who have what is good will be snatched away by the evil one. Those who have care for the things of the world, the lure of wealth, are like those who have shallow roots. Those things of the world, wealth, their own lives, none of those things can be taken, truly. So when Jesus is talking to us about what can be taken away, he's talking about the joy and the peace 
that people can find in God through Christ. He's talking about being as lost as any of those seeds that are scattered on the path or on the rocky ground or amongst the thorns. When we live without the gospel in our lives, we too lose. The immediacy and the power of God's presence in our lives may start to fade. It may start to fade when we find ourselves willing to let one sheep stay lost. We're less likely then to go out and look for the next one. When we demand that we are to be first, we're less likely to care about those who come behind us, much less the last and the least of these. When we choose not to see our neighbors in their struggles, or in their pain, or in their confusion, we cannot be said to have love for them. There's a deep hope in these agricultural metaphors, though. For even if what little we have is taken from us, even if we let the gospel, forgive the pun here, go to seed in our lives, even if we have shallow roots, even if we find ourselves choked by thorns, this is not the end of things. One of the things I have learned from tending gardens and woods and fields and yards is that you can always clear thorns away. You can cut them back to allow room for new growth. You can transplant plants with shallow roots into good soil so that they may become plants which bear fruits and yield a hundredfold, or sixty, or thirty. What I find truly amazing about this parable of the sower is that so often we do this type of agricultural maintenance, cutting back thorns, transplanting into good soil. We do so much of this for others, and they do it for us. And in doing so, we can see God working through the things in our lives to effect changes upon us, to get us out of the rocky ground and into the good soil. A couple of years ago, uh, I visited some friends in Boston. And at the time, uh, I was working part-time for the church, and I was making up the rest of my schedule uh, doing construction. And this was a tight time in my life financially. Uh, I didn't have a lot of extra money to spend on anything. And so while I was visiting some friends in Boston, someone broke into my car and stole my overcoat. And I was hurt. I loved this coat. But the loss of it showed me how blessed I actually was. I had six or seven other coats at home. I was going to be fine. It reminded me that even when I was in this financially stressed time in my life, I still had so much. I could have been bitter about that loss. I could have been bitter about someone breaking into my car. I could have allowed those thorns of caring about the things of the world, those thorns could easily have choked me. But instead, I was able to clear those thorns away. God was able to clear those thorns out of my life and remind me that I was blessed. That wasn't my only coat, I had others. God reminded me that I was planted in good soil and that I was called to care less about the cares of the world. It doesn't take something as radical or as invasive as having your car broken into to see through these lenses. The small kindnesses of daily life can be like fertilizer for each other. Reaching out to a friend with a phone call or an email or a text can brighten their day. Sharing your food, sharing your resources, can enrich both you and whoever you share with. Uh, 
back in my Psychology 101 class, we uh, heard something from Ben Franklin, uh, who said the best way to turn an enemy into the friend is to ask them to loan you a book. It's a simple favor, but it develops a relationship between the giver and the recipient. And with that simple loan, a relationship is kindled, making the next steps of relationship easier and easier. And with a little effort, an enemy can be turned into a friend. How much easier then for us who begin as friends, friends in this community, friends in Christ, how much easier to build upon the relationships that God has placed us into, to help cut the thorns back in the lives of our friends, to transplant them into good soil when they seem scorched and weary, to help each and every one of us bring forth the bounty God has created us for. In this way, we can all be caretakers for one another, working to bless others as we ourselves are blessed, until all of us are as numerous as the tomatoes and peppers and zucchini that fill our gardens and our roadside stands this time of the year. So as you go about your week, my friends, may you bear good fruit. May you find yourselves nurtured by your friends, by your family, by strangers, and by God above. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
Amen.